So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samantha and uh, thank you everyone for your interest in today's webinar, as well as in Aquatic Habitat Canada. And today's session is actually the third webinar uh, of our learning and engagement dialogue series, obviously on the topic uh, financing aquatic habitat restoration initiatives in Canada. HC is a national organization working to promote aquatic habitat conservation, particularly restoration. And we are hosting this webinar series um, as part of our program to not only improve our AHC network, but also to engage in a greater understanding of issues related uh, to this work and to aquatic habitat restoration. And I'll start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, as we continue in this virtual environment, uh, land acknowledgements look a bit different. Um, so I'll take the time to encourage everyone uh, to jump into the chat window um, and introduce yourself and your organization, as well as the traditional territories uh, from which you find yourself tuning in today. And I am calling in from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations, um, which are uh, protected by the Dish With One Spoon uh, Wampum Belt Covenant. Um, my name, again, is Samantha, and I am the Communications and Project Coordinator here at AHC. I've included my email in the bottom left of the screen just for your reference. If you'd like to reach out about any of the material presented in today's webinar, or have any questions or input about the work that we are conducting. You can also stay updated with AHC through our website, and I encourage you to follow us on our social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn. And AHC is a networking organization. We play an important role in habitat protection and restoration across the country. Um, and we're made up of a diverse group of members and supporters um, spanning regions and sectors uh, across the land, uh, including conservation authorities, indigenous groups, um, practitioners, we have policy analysts and researchers, uh, and many, many more. Um, and part of our work is to facilitate collaboration and discussion like the one held today to support planning and priority setting for aquatic habitat protection and restoration. So the scope of today's dialogue, um, we are uh, very lucky uh, and privileged to host a expert panel uh, to present their experiences uh, with both acquiring and administrating funding resources. We hope uh, to inform our, our larger network and, and the attendees of today's webinar on the key challenges, opportunities, and issues related to aquatic habitat restoration. This will be a, a learning forum that we hope will prompt uh, a productive conversation about the successes, limitations, and options um, when thinking about funding uh, future initiatives. So before we jump right in, I want to guide your attention to a funding tool that we have available on our website. And this can be accessed both through the link uh, on the screen, as well as if you're using a mobile or tablet on the QR code on the bottom right. And this is in addition to several other very helpful resources found on our website, Aquatic Habitat Canada. So just a quick walk through of what you'll see when you visit our site, in addition to some background in, uh, information on our organization, what we do, the pillars that guide our work, uh, events like the one today, there are several resources that can be accessed either by clicking this button on the middle of the home page or at the top on uh, the tab. So in addition to uh, success stories about aquatic habitat conservation, uh, protection and restoration, there's also guidance documents and AHC produced reports. But really here, we're looking for the uh, funding resource tool. And this is a compilation of relevant funding programs and grants available um, in various provinces and territories. So it's organized by province and territory, but for example sake today, we'll just look at the Canadian wide uh, tab. And these are resources that are available and applicable uh, across the country. 
And this is similar to what you'll see on the, on the other funding tools for each province and territory. Um, but it is a list of relevant sources with a brief description and a link which will bring you out uh, to the main site for more pertinent information like deadlines um, and relevance to your project, et cetera. So that's just a quick um, snapshot. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping items. Um, you will notice that your video, your uh, camera and your microphone have been turned off for the duration of the presentations. Um, this session is being recorded and a version of the webinar will be made available shortly after today, both on YouTube and on our website. If you access the chat window, we do encourage you uh, to engage with the other attendees here. Um, and to just make sure that you're checking all panelists and attendees if you would like to um, address everyone. Uh, if you don't, the message will only be seen by myself and the panelists. We will be reserving all our questions uh, after all the speakers have presented, uh, but please feel more than welcome to uh, populate your questions in the Q&A um, window, which can be accessed on the bottom bar. We might not uh, have enough time to attend to all the questions, but we hope that uh, we'll engage with the speakers and we can follow up after today's webinar. And one final thing, if you do find yourself disconnected from the Zoom platform, you can log in um, with the same link that you signed in from originally. So we are very lucky to have a panel of, of six presenters uh, to speak about their expertise um, in securing and administrating funds for restoration initiatives across Canada. And the order of today's events uh, will have about 10 minutes of presentation from each speaker, but we've reserved uh, the latter half of the webinar uh, to open up the proverbial Zoom uh, stage uh, to the audience. So uh, we do welcome if you find yourself from a differing sector uh, or you have a different opinion or point of view commentary that you would like to share about today's topic, uh, we'll be able to allow you to present about two to three minutes of presentation afterwards. And then we'll wrap up finally with a Q&A session. So without further ado, um, we will be starting today's presentation with Chris Hunter. Chris Hunter is based out of Annie Ganish in Nova Scotia. He is the Director of Programs uh, for Nova Scotia and PEI for the Atlantic Sam Salmon Federation. So go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Samantha, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'll kick this off, uh, which I'm sure are going to be a number of great talks. Uh, as I said, as Samantha said, I'm coming from Anaganish, Nova Scotia, the land of the Mi'kma'ki people. Um, and I'm a program director with the Atlantic Salmon Federation, which means that I both administer projects for the Atlantic Salmon Federation directly, but I also have a key role in supporting many other watershed groups uh, in their projects. And that's what I'll be speaking to you about today. Um, so just for, I'll, I'll try and run through this pretty quickly. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about ASF and, and our different groups that we work with. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about funding, strengths and weaknesses, uh, and then if there's time, we'll go through some case studies, and then I'll, I'll kind of try and sum it all up with some lessons that I've learned. Um, so uh, ASF uh, is a international charitable organization uh, whose mandate is to um, protect and conserve and restore wild Atlantic salmon. Uh, as an organization, we are actually uh, private, predominantly pr privately funded. Um, so we're coming at it perhaps from a little different than some of our other groups. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about you know, the benefits and, and, and drawbacks of that. Uh, we conduct research, uh, we engage in very large scale complex restoration, uh, and we do a lot of advocacy work as well. So that's kind of generally all the high level overview of what we do. Uh, and although I'll be talking about salmon restoration here, um, uh, we treat salmon as an indicator species uh, because of their key role in both the freshwater and saltwater ecosystem. So really what we're talking about is ecosystem restoration. So uh, although I'll say salmon, you can, you can substitute the word ecosystem there. 
Um, in terms of our partners, um, ASF is a true federation um, in that uh, each group that we work with is completely independent of us and, and is free to and often does disagree with us, uh, but it also means they're financially independent from us as well. Uh, our network is uh, consists of over six state and provincial councils and over 100 affiliated groups representing something 25,000 members and volunteers. In addition to our, our sort of federation, we also partner with many, many other organizations, many of which you're going to hear from later today on this call, um, as well, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups um, are represented in both our affiliates and in uh, our partners. Generally speaking, most of what I'm going to be talking today is about our groups and affiliates. Uh, those are uh, generally um, smaller organizations with a much more narrow focus that, that tend to rely much more on grant and project money. So I'll be able to pro provide a little bit of perspective on that as well. So if we look at ASF, um, our, uh, as I mentioned, we're sort of privately funded which gives uh, uh, us a lot of independence. Um, we're not, uh, because we have private donors giving us money uh, because they believe in our mandate, we, we're not really beholden to anybody and we can stick pretty closely to our mandate. So that is certainly one sort of advantage. The disadvantage or contrary of that is, is that what it means is that we have to have a very large development department that their sole job is, is to work with our donors and, and ensure that, that our trust is maintained and that we can continue. Um, We've been very successful in that regard uh, in maintaining that, that fund funding at, at a high level for many, many years. And so as a result, we, we've been a very stable in terms of our staff. We've had many of our staff have been in place for over 20 years. And that has enabled us to build up a lot of internal capacity and expertise, which of course then helps us in terms of our projects, but also in terms of those that we support. Uh, as an organization uh, and from a from a, when we approach funders, we, we tend to deal with the larger focus, bigger picture policy type issues on the national and international levels. And so um, that is good, but it does mean that we have some challenges sometimes in terms of addressing sort of immediate needs and things that arise quite quickly, uh, especially on the localized level. That's where we tend to try and work with our groups to address those. So um, the biggest challenge that we are currently facing is, is that the, uh, the, with the generational shift from baby boomers to millennials, we are seeing uh, quite a shift in funder dynamics. There's more emphasis on, on environmentalism, which is great, uh, but it does, uh, and conservation, but that does create some challenges because they want to be engaged with in different ways. So uh, that's sort of where we're at with that. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm speaking mostly about our, our smaller groups here, um, but they're generally quite goal oriented and project focused, um, which has enabled them to develop a lot of uh, local indigenous and non-indigenous local and regional knowledge. So um, most of the groups that we have are really focused on, uh, on their community or on their, their localized watershed, and they know that very well. They know the issues, they know the solutions. Uh, they're actually usually more limited by the ability to, um, the funding to actually go through and do that. Um, they tend to be very, very grant dependent, uh, which means that, uh, that they, you know, they may have, they may know they need to address A, B, and C, but they can only get funding for A. The other sort of issue that they have is, is they typically have is, is that they, the getting admin money is quite difficult. So that's always a challenge uh, for our groups which has led to a, a real issue with staff retention and building up of capacity. Um, you know, we've got a lot of good groups and they've got a lot of expertise, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are struggling with capacity and retention. So that is, that, that is, you know, they've got a lot of knowledge, they've got a lot of, um, you know, solutions and they, they know what needs to be done, uh, but they're very often limited uh, in terms of capacity and in terms of finances. So shifting gears slightly, I want to highlight uh, a couple. I've got three projects here. I probably won't get through all of them, but um, we've got a number of projects where we've kind of been able to work with our partners uh, and really facilitate some things to happen. So uh, one of our showcase pieces is our main headwaters project. You can see the link to our website right there. Um, this has been a very successful project where we've been looking at addressing the major fish passage issues that have existed in the state of Maine. Uh, this was identified uh, after once, many, once salmon were identified as an endangered species. Um, that was one of the biggest things is this fish passage issue. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's the watersheds are, are quite, quite large there and uh, it is it was too difficult to manage for any one group. So we were able to step up and take on a facilitator role, uh, bring in lots of different partners uh, and raise a lot of capital, a lot of funds uh, to actually see a lot of things happen. And, and over the past 20 years, uh, we've seen, you can see the number of successes that I've got on my screen there that we've managed to achieve on that. 
Um, all told, uh, we're at the about the $75 million mark, what we've spent over the last 20, uh, 20 years on these projects. So uh, we've been able to bring together a lot of finances and accomplish a lot. And uh, really what we attribute that uh, to is this, us being able to play this facilitator role where we put up some of our own money, but we're able to bring in different partners. So on all of these, any given one of these projects, and there's been over 40 sort of separate projects as part of the main headwaters program, um, you know, we've had anywhere from a dozen to two or three dozen uh, partners on those projects. That's funders, government agencies, but that's also landowners, historical societies, uh, the industries. And so we played a big role of bringing people together and by bringing people together, working on towards common goals uh, and, uh, you know, overcoming differences, we've been able to then um, band together and raise, raise this incredible amount of funds and then make this incredible success. So that, that's certainly one piece that we like to really highlight. Um, another good example of this is this on PEI, there is the Agri Watershed Partnership. So in this case, it wasn't ASF playing the facilitator role, it was the province. They recognized that they were funding the, uh, the farm industry uh, there for economic reasons. It's their major economic driver on, on PEI. Uh, but they were also funding a lot of environmental, they're funding watershed groups to develop watershed management plans and, and to improve things. So they um, were, um, they realized and they were funding two different things and there was a lot of conflict between the two. There was a lot of battles between individual farmers and watershed groups and, and the Watershed Alliance, which is the coalition of all the groups and, and the um, uh, Agriculture, Federation of Agriculture. So what they said is let's get everybody together um, and we're gonna give some seed money. So once again, like we did, they gave some seed money. In this case, it was half a million dollars. And they said, okay, you guys get together, form your partnership and you sort it out. And so that's really what we're seeing happening now. This is there's been a very systematic approach of going through and saying, okay, what are our biggest issues and how can we go about addressing them through best management practices? So they, they made a, they said they did, did a big review in 2019 and there was this whole COVID thing, which sort of slowed everybody down a little bit. But in 2021, they were able to get together um, uh, this year, and they're actually putting those into place with all the subsequent research, Mario, and outreach. So just a lot of lot of good things happening by bringing people together. Uh, and now we've got individual farmers chipping in, you know, ten thousand, hundred thousand uh, dollars out of their own operations to try and uh, make this happen. Uh, I'm going to just in the interest of time, uh, there's another example here, the NSSA water project is with just this um, watershed assessment towards ecosystem recovery, really the same idea. In this case, it was the NSSA using federal money uh, and money from groups such as the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, which you're going to hear from here in a little bit, um, to try and actually develop uh, watershed plans and actually really solidify, okay, what exactly do we need to recover uh, these these five endangered species that we're focused on. So uh, another example of success, which I'll, I'll just skip over because I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about what, what have we learned with all this. Um, so one of the big things we've learned is, is you need somebody to take on a facilitator role. Um, somebody has to be the one that is going to go through and play facilitator. It helps if they can put in seed money, but even if they can't, somebody needs to take that leadership role and kind of and get that there. And that is just as important as the money. And then partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. That's That's been the key to every single one of these successes. We need to have as many different partners come in uh, from as many different sectors. You need to have your indigenous knowledge. You need to have your indigenous partners. You need to have your non-indigenous partners, industry, environment, everything. They all have to be there and working together. Funders have a really important role. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different, you have private funders, you have uh, government and public sources of funding. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that we have, especially on the public side of funding, is, is a lot of that tends to come from various political will or um, political ideology of the day. And that doesn't always mess, uh, match with needs. As I mentioned, that we're really seeing that in the like, groups that they need to do A, B, and C, but they can only get funding to do A or they can't get admin funds. So, you know, we really need the funders, some changes there to look at how can we actually better develop these funds so that we're meeting the mandates of the Fisheries Act, of the Agricultural Act, because we've got some great statements in, in a lot of our, our legislation, but we're getting this disconnect. So that, that, that needs to be um, addressed. Uh, I, I love this. Ignorance is bliss on every single project I've ever been a part of that's been successful. Uh, people generally look back at it 10 years later and say, oh, if I had known what I was getting myself into, I would not have done it to begin with. Um, there's an incredible amount of um, a risk associated if you really want to push the envelope. And so from a financials perspective, we have to be able to willing to take on that risk. 
uh, I know we're talking a lot about that now with offsetting and banking. Uh, you know, you want to have guaranteed if you're an industry and you have to do it. If you're a, a con contractor or if you're a government, you know, you want to see some guarantees there. But if we want to really address what's happening, you know, we need to be, a, a, you know, we have to be a little bit ignorant and we have to, we have to be willing to take on some risk. Communications is really key. We need to have groups talking together, as I've already said, uh, and talking early. That's, that's a major piece. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've had an industry partner come to me and say, look, uh, I have to do this offset. Uh, what, what, you know, what do you have in the, in the works? And I've got projects, but you know, like, like industry and like government, I've got my work plans already set out for the next year, next two years, three years, five years. So, uh, you know, I can't necessarily make something happen on the timeline they want it. So early communication is really key so that we can say, okay, we can build that into our work plan, especially for groups that are limited. And lastly, and I won't go on too much of this because I know several of the other speakers are going to talk about this, but opportunities. I think there are an incredible amount of opportunities out there if we get industry working with uh, with our with our ENGO groups, with in local uh, local organizations, with indigenous groups. I think if we start to see those partnerships, um, I think there are an incredible amount of opportunities out there. But we do have to kind of all come together and 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 try and get along and communicate, and and I think that will open up. Because as I, as I was trying to lay out in the beginning, we've got groups out there that have got the knowledge, they know what needs to be done. We've got industry uh, and government and, and, and those sort of things that where they have to give money. And so um, bringing the two together, I think will be, will be a, a great, great opportunity. And with that, I'll wrap up and I think I'm on time. So thank you everybody. And we'll chat in the question period. Thanks, Chris. That was a great overview of your work and uh, very insightful lessons learned to consider in the discussion. Next up, we are going to hear from Stephen Chase. Uh, Stephen is the executive director of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization based out of Fredericton and provides funding to community partnerships uh, working to improve conservation of wild salmon. I'm also learning how to use PowerPoint. Looks great. So just bear with me for a second. So slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. OK, well, thank you, uh, Samantha. I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm speaking to you from Fredericton on the uh, banks of the beautiful uh, St. John River, Wollastock, in the unceded territory of the Wollastockwe people. Although we work right across Atlantic Canada and Quebec, I'll, I'll uh, speak from that uh, unceded territory. We are, um, first and foremost, uh, an organization that's oriented towards helping community groups uh, pursue their conservation objectives. We're a funding entity, you know, and I'll, I'll touch bases on that, but uh, we, we place a lot of emphasis on facilitating, uh, putting uh, funding into the hands of people and then facilitating uh, their ability to use it. Uh, it's something that we've learned over the uh, 15 years that we've been in business as a, a granting entity but it's all very much about helping people do things. We're not out there doing it, we're helping people do things. Um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, the main objectives that we're, uh, we're in business to do is to foster partnership. We work across uh, five provinces, uh, Quebec and the four Atlantic provinces. Um, we have at least 200 different conservation partners and we treat our recipients uh, very much as partners. As I said, we, uh, we support and facilitate their conservation activity. We um, are primarily a volunteer organization. We only have three paid staff you know, here at the office. Um, we have 60 some odd volunteers serving on our board of directors and, and our uh, expert advisory committees uh, that we have in each province. So we have five provincial advisory committees and one uh, scientific advisory committee. And they're all extremely competent in, in the area in which they, uh, they operate. And as I said before, we are a granting entity. We are not an advocacy organization. 
I mean, we might engage in soft advocacy, but we're not out there, uh, you know, critiquing uh, government uh, errors or omissions. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the beginning of the, the foundation was a grant called the Atlantic Salmon Endowment Fund. That's very similar to the Pacific Salmon Endowment Fund that was granted around uh, 2000. Uh, we received the grant in 2007. It was a $30 million grant in order to create a trust fund, and we formed up as a nonprofit charity. So all of our projects are funded from investment income. We, we are mandated to protect the, uh, the capital amount of the investment, which now stands at about $46 million. So, uh, you know, we have a very uh, competent uh, investment management committee that helps us do that. And then uh, they, they're the ones that tell us what our annual allocation is. I think above all, we have a, a very fair and transparent distribution of money in project recruitment. I'll explain a little bit of that in a minute. But uh, uh, clearly uh, we had options when we could allocate money among the five provinces. And uh, doing it, uh, you know, equally, it just wasn't right. So basically, the allocation is done on the, the volume of, of uh, fish habitat in each of the provinces, which means that, that uh, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland get the, uh, the bulk of the funding, with the lesser amount in Nova Scotia, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the lowest amount, $110,000 or so a year to PEI, we also allocate up to 30% for applied research funding. So the, the eligible objects that, that uh, we fund, um, you know, include development of, uh, we do put an emphasis on developing of watershed management plans. And from that, an identification of priority issues. And then from that, applications to us for funding. So that, that's our primary objective is to foster planning uh, which, which is not a given necessarily, you know, with a lot of groups that we work with, but it, it's improved markedly over the 15 years. Um, then we, our aims are to, to fund a restoration of habitat uh, or rest, restoration protection of habitat, as well as uh, rebuilding restoration of uh, salmon populations and uh, access to habitat and public education and awareness. So those are fairly general um, uh, eligible objects. Most everything we get will fit within uh, you know, one or the other, but we do ask applicants to tell us you know, what they're applying for, of course. So our process is uh, we have one annual application, middle of November, and uh, we uh, inform our provincial advisory committees are the primary here because they receive and review the applications and they make recommendations to our board of directors um, <clears throat> which projects should be funded. We do have a very rigorous um, uh, review process uh, and it must have worked quite well because in, in 14 uh, uh, rounds of grants, We've hardly ever had a complaint. You know, with a thousand applications or so that we've received over that period of time, we've hardly ever have a, a complaint. And, and I attribute that in large measure to the fact that within each province, most of the applicants know our advisory committee and they know that they're doing the work properly. And um, we also provide a, a feedback loop, you know, to people that aren't successful in the first go around uh, we want them to be successful at some future uh, point. So we, we always provide reasons. If someone wasn't successful, you know, in getting money, we give them reasons why not. And we'll work with them in the course of the year to, to help them. We won't write the application for them, but we certainly, uh, our, our goal at the end of the day is to give out money and is to make it as easy as possible to get. And we, uh, we try to put money into the hands of the successful recipient groups very early in the field season so that they're, they're able to uh, work with it. Um, if they run into difficulties in the course of the year that they can't get things like landowner permissions or 
or high water events or some such thing, you know, that uh, impedes the, uh, the, the rolling out of the process. We'll work with the recipient. Uh, some cases carry over the project funding to the next fiscal year. You know, we're not bound by uh, the same sort of, uh, you know, annual cycle that government is in, in granting money. Uh, we're quite rigorous in, uh, in monitoring the projects. Um, it was a bit of a challenge in the early years uh, because uh, some of the groups weren't used to that. But, um, you know, now it, it seems to work extremely well. And as I say, we have a good reputation among the groups that we fund, you know, for fairness and, and support. Um, lastly, I mentioned that we do put about 30% of our funding, which would be uh, between three and 400,000 a year into applied research projects, which we solicit uh, via RFP. It's a little different from the, uh, the grant projects in the provinces where we pretty much take what we get um, in the research funding, we, uh, our scientific committee is quite specific in what it's looking for. And so we fund our pro those projects through, uh, through RFP they, and ultimately they have to be peer reviewed in order to get all of the funding. So th this image will give you a sense of where the projects are distributed. Uh, there's a lot of concentric circles here. But uh, you can see we're, we're giving a very good distribution right across uh, Atlantic Canada and Quebec, uh, well within the range of the wild Atlantic salmon. Um, just a little bit of um, statistics. We've received up until this year about 1,000 proposals, and we've funded uh, uh, 666. It's a magic number. Our total contributions uh, beginning in 2008 to date is uh, just under 11 million. Um, the um, overall project value, which would be cash and in kind, is uh, uh, just under 60 million. And we enjoy a, a pretty good leveraging of uh, five, five to one. So in, in terms of uh, what, has, what we've helped achieve, you know, I emphasize we, we, we have helped groups achieve this, these goals. Uh, 76 million square meters of habitat have been improved by the groups that we've uh, supported uh, or open. Um, 1.8 million uh, square meters of habitat improved. Uh, we're also, we're not measured on the number of jobs that we've helped create or sustain, but you know, we're pushing between 2,500 and 3,000 jobs. This is serious. It's uh, mostly full-time, uh, e e well, it's full-time equivalents. It, it's mostly seasonal work, but the, you know, there's some full-time jobs in there. Um, specifically, uh, Indigenous-led projects, we've uh, granted funding of about a million bucks to uh, you know, various uh, Indigenous organizations across the region. And uh, to date, it's uh, roughly $2, two million dollars that we've contributed to applied research. Uh, it's not all rosy, though. Um, I like this bar chart because what it's telling us uh, when our advisory committees score the, these proposals, there's a number of really good proposals that we just don't have the funding to uh, accommodate. Uh, it's running around uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent of, um, of the grants or, or of the, uh, the applications that we received that we're able to give money to. So there's quite a few groups that aren't able to get money on an annual basis. But as I said before, you know, we work with them to try to bring them, you know, get them back and help them. There's a lot of them who are repeat funders. Um, so I'm getting towards the end, but I have to leave you with some contact information here. Um, these are our emails, and uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to go to our website um, there at, at, at the bottom. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's many days when I look back at what we've done while, you know, I've given you a fairly uh, a brief and, and uh, hopefully informative picture. Um, at the end of the day, I, th I think we're actually, we've been in the cat herding business, you know, for 15 years. There are so many groups out there that are engaged in salmon conservation to uh, one level or another. We're trying to get them uh, focused 
And working together is a lot like herding cats. Uh, and this is the other side of our operation is that we are actively working with our partner groups to uh, encourage the government to help us uh, be able to go back and, and address some of this, uh, the uh, total demand on our bar chart here. So it's, uh, and that would fall into our soft advocacy. So with that, again, I would say thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions after, we'll be pleased to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Great. Thank you, Stephen. That's a, a very uh, uh, informative and unique perspective from a granting entity. Um, next up, we'll hear from George Russell Jr., who is the Director of Environment and Natural, Natural Resources, uh, joining us from Nunatukavut Community Council. Hi, and uh, thank you, Samantha. Uh, my name is uh, George Russell Jr. and uh, I'm the uh, Director of Environmental and Natural Resources for the uh, Nunatu Hawit Community Council in uh, Labrador. And uh, our organization, uh, the NTC, we uh, represent the uh, about 6,000 uh, Inuit from uh, Nunatu Hawit, Nunatu Hawit communities uh, basically along uh, uh, south and central uh, Labrador. And uh, my presentation, I'm, I'm basically going to talk a little bit about uh, our people and our communities and uh, also talk about uh, some, some projects that we've uh, worked on and um, talk a little bit about uh, some, some things that we'd like to hopefully see, see funded or find some partners to work with uh, in the future. So. Uh, basically, uh, the the people of uh, Nunatu Havut uh, were the uh, were the ancestors, or the, uh, the uh, our ancestors are the uh, mixed blood people, really, of uh, Inuit and European settlers that that came to our territory in the 1600s or earlier, in some cases. Uh, Nunatu Havut uh, means our ancient land in Inupituk. It's the territory of uh, Nunatu Havut Inuit. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, our people primarily reside in central and uh, southern Labrador. And our people are really, uh, you know, we're shaped by the, the land, the sea, and the ice. And our communities are, are I guess, to some degree, st strategically located in areas that uh, of abundance and importance uh, to, to uh, Inuit people for survival and both culturally and, and subsistence. And like many indigenous people in Canada, you know, we've, we've had some uh, experiences with colonialism, uh, you know, the impacts on our language, culture and education and our way of life. Uh, and, you know, we continue to try to work through this and uh, work with Canada and, and other people to help uh, reconcile and, and move forward. Uh, our people are, are very resilient. You know, we, we still cling to, to the rocks of um, Southern Labrador, very re many remote communities. Uh, we, you know, we continue to practice our our traditional ways and, uh, you know, uh, honor our culture and our ancestors. Um, today, uh, the Nuntu Community Council, the NCC, who, who uh, I work for is, uh, we basically represent uh, 6,000 Inuit that live primarily along the south coast of Labrador and many small remote indigenous communities in, uh, in central uh, Labrador as well. The vision for, uh, for the NCC is to govern ourselves, provide uh, for each other, our families, uh, for our communities, uh, while also nurturing you know, a strong relationship with the land, ice, sea, and waters of our territory. The Nunatu Habut Community Council, we're rights-bearing people. Um, we've, uh, 2018, we've uh, 
uh, signed an agreement with Canada to work towards, uh, you know, um, our uh, attendance fine and, and uh, you know, self-governance to some degree. Uh, some people say land claims, but we'll see. Um, and our people, again, uh, you know, very connected to our territory. Uh, you know, we make a living there. And uh, still practicing very traditional ways, uh, crabs, hunting, fishing, um, many ways in many places that our, our people have for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And our communities, we kind of look like this. Uh, you know, if you can envision Labrador, uh, recently uh, located along these, a lot of these coastal areas, uh, in some of the rivers and, and the headlands uh, along south and central Labrador. Uh, you know, and some of our places, this is what they look like, you know, uh, small remote communities along, along the headlands where we we depend a lot on uh, the salmon char, uh, seals, birds, sea mammals, uh, migratory birds, cod, that sort of thing. In July 12, 2018, uh, we uh, we announced, I guess, a new a new relationship, a new partnership with Canada, uh, based on uh, the recognition of our indigenous rights, uh, self determination, and, uh, and reconciliation with Canada. And our organization, you know, we continue to build our to try to build our capacity uh, to be self governing in many ways, such as health, education, culture natural resources, research and, and business development. And, uh, you know, I heard Chris talk earlier about retention of, of uh, experts and scientists and stuff. And, you know, we feel those, those challenges as well. Um, also want to talk a bit about the, uh, some restoration projects and work that we've done here in, uh, in, in the Duha Yeah, about uh, four years ago, we, we entered into a partnership with uh, World Wildlife Fund and VFO Canada. Um, and basically, you know, we, we developed a project um, to help identify, restore some coastal habitats uh, for some priority fish species, um, Caitlin, uh, Atlantic salmon, Arctic char, those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, we basically, with the, with the purpose to um, identify any threats and, and maybe reestablish or restore some coastal habitats and, and those sorts of things. So um, project is in the, uh, in the last year now, and uh, you know, we have, we've had some good outcomes. Part, as part of that uh, funding, you know, we, we did some community consultations to uh, using or I guess uh, availing of indigenous knowledge to uh, help identify, you know, threats, opportunities, um, establish some best practices, uh, identify habitats, uh, you know, that, that may be threatened. And also we, we really used our communities and our, and our indigenous knowledge to help us prioritize sites for monitoring and uh, restoration. And part of that, you know, we also did, uh, Coastal surveys uh, you know, uh, to kind of quantify any factors affecting um, the, uh, coastal changes, erosion, evaluate any kind of imminent risk. Um, also look at long-term restoration and development planning and help us uh, strategize and develop policies around coastal environmental changes. And you know we did a lot with. Uh, with drone work as well as going in and actually visibly uh, walking a lot of our beaches and, and things. Uh, a part of that project as well, you know, we uh, we installed a beaver baffler there on, on one uh, very important salmon river uh, that, uh, that the beavers had moved into and, and set up the dam and uh, back, you know, Prior to this, a few years ago, we, you know, people would just kind of come in and tear out the, the beaver dams in a lot of our rivers. But uh, you know, we've tried to work with the with the beavers, and I and you know, we feel like uh, you know, this project here was a, was certainly a good example of uh, you know um, trying to uh, keep keep the natural habitat intact, but uh, and allowing fish passage. And we can continue to monitor this project here, and it seems like it was working really well. It's 
been in place for almost a year now, and uh, and to date, it, it seems to be uh, no issues. And also, we've had projects uh, in uh, the marine protected area, uh, Gilbert Bay Marine Protected Area. You know, where we had some some local. Uh, uh, members of our organization uh, remove old fishing nets from from abandoned fish uh, stations, dilapidated buildings. There was also hazardous waste, old batteries, and these sorts of things in in that area. And uh, you know, this is just one of uh, of many sites like this we have in uh, along in the Thulawood that we're working to try to find and secure funding for to help clean up. And there's some pictures here. You know, you can see some old. Uh, uh, gill nets there and, and drums and fuel as one of our uh, our members there in a small boat that uh, went into this kind of remote area and worked with, with us and not just to help clean it up and you can see some of the down in the bottom right there you know the habitat the way it was kind of left when we when we finished so and that's just an example uh, i think uh, that we're hoping uh, can be a model that uh, we can use moving forward because we literally have hundreds of these uh, abandoned fish, old fishing stations uh, along our coast. And we're really in the process now of trying to, uh, I guess, secure funding or partners that can help us, um, you know, work together. And, and, and uh, uh, again, using indigenous knowledge uh, and ways of doing things that we can, uh, we can move, uh, clean up a lot of these, eliminate a lot of those threats. So, um, I guess kind of moving forward, uh, you know, our organization, we have a lot of concerns with, with ghost gear, old fishing gear left in a lot of these uh, very important areas. Uh, we, we have hundreds of, as I mentioned, old abandoned fishing stations from when the cod fishery was, was booming along our coast. Uh, some people just kind of walked away and, and left things as were, and, and now many of them are starting to fall down and, and old fishing gear, um, some hazardous material and things are starting to fall into the water. So uh, I guess that that certainly a big priority for us, and we're we're hoping, you know through these types of conversations and, and relationships that we can find some people to work with and and maybe even secure funding to to assess this and, and see what we can do about it. So and that's uh, basically it for me. Thank you. Not for me. Great, thank you so much, George Russell Jr. Um, next, we will hear from Tom Duffy, who's joining us uh, from the Atlantic. He is the manager of Atlantic operations for Ducks Unlimited Canada, um, and has spent the majority of his career uh, being involved working with programs um, involving agriculture, communities, wetlands, and waterfowl. So go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to listen to the other speakers uh, uh, up to this point. Uh, I'm joining uh, you folks today from Charlottetown PEI, and uh, which is part, small part of the uh, uh, Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, the original caretakers of this, this piece of land. Uh, I've been uh, working with uh, Ducks Unlimited now for 21 years, and prior to that, uh, 11 years with the with the province of PEI, and uh, so the fun part of my job is I get to oversee the the conservation program or outreach and education programs and the and the science programs here across Atlantic Canada. The the more challenging part, um, and for some reason my screen is not advancing. There we go. So the more challenging part of my job is, is the fundraising aspect of it. And I suspect uh, I, uh, there's lots of heads nodding out there that many of you uh, joined your organizations probably with a biological background and, and you want to be doing the work in the field and, uh, and the hands-on work. But uh, you recognize that in order to do that, we got to have the resources. So uh, we, like many other organizations, uh, depend on various funding sources. Uh, uh, we do have some international support uh, because of the migratory birds that, uh, that flow uh, throughout North America. 
we've done our regular fundraising events, philanthropic uh, giving and foundations and government grants are important. But one of the areas that uh, I want to speak and focus on here today is, is regulatory compliance and the need for uh, uh, industry or government to comply with various regulations and provide uh, offsetting habitat. And just to, to catch your attention, uh, you know, prior to uh, 2010, uh, this was, was really a small piece of business for Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we raised uh, less than a million dollars a year in this. And then over the, over the past 10 years now, that's increased to about 15 million annually uh, across the country. And it, it, it really is only going to grow. And there, there, is, there is a significant amount of this revenue out there. Our clients to date uh, have been uh, various levels of government, um, the energy sector, urban developers, private landowners. And the, the value of this is that uh, we can get this funding and apply it to our restoration projects. And it, it covers really hard things for uh, nonprofits to raise money for you know, in finding the projects, delivering the projects. Well, we, that's probably one of the easier ones, but maintaining the project into the future requires maintenance. And the real challenge covering staff costs, your overheads, and in all our projects, we build in a contingency and which is money left over after you've paid everything so that uh, we can finance some of the other aspects of our program where it is difficult to find, uh, find revenue for particularly our communications or science and some of our education programs. So there's, there's real value there for uh, the, uh, the NGO community. Where we're getting um, access to this revenue is through, federally through the Fisheries Act, um, through the federal policy on wetland conservation. And then depending on the, whatever jurisdiction you're in, there may be opportunities through provincial wetland conservation policies or environment acts that, that are there. And it's basically, it, it's operating on the polluter pay principle so that if a, if a development um, alters wetlands or alters fish habitat, then the proponent has to provide uh, uh, habitat offsets. And quite often that is cash to uh, conservation organizations to, uh, uh, to do this work. The way the, the process works is the proponent applies and receives an environmental permit or authorization from a regulatory agency. And I, you know, I, I draw a fairly distinct line that we do not get involved in that part of it. Uh, we're very clear in that our role is not to facilitate wetland loss, it's to facilitate uh, restoration. And if, if a client is interested in doing that, they're on their own. We don't provide advice on how they go about it. We don't help it. But the next step, once they have their permits in hand, is that they need a plan and they need a restoration project. And some of these uh, proponents are big enough that they have their own in-house capabilities to do some of this restoration work, or they hire uh, one of their environmental consultants that they regularly go to. But what we've seen in on a on a uh, more regular basis now is that these companies or individuals or government are reaching out to conservation organizations to provide the service. And I think it's an important point that, that we actually, Ducks Unlimited, we actually did not go out seeking uh, this work, that it was actually clients coming to us, uh, seeing if we would do the work for them. And then again, we had to kind of learn how to how to do this, how to cover all our costs, but uh, it was very much uh, the organ they seeking our, our uh, uh, skills. So what we found and one of the, you know, one of the things we've learned is that the clients want to comply with environmental regulations. And that's, that's pretty much universal with whoever we're working with. They do want predictability on timing and costs. Um, and the other thing that they really deal with is they don't want to manage or monitor on an ongoing basis a habitat project. So they want somebody else to deal with that. And, but they're quite willing to pay somebody else to do with that, to deal with that. So the things that the 
conservation organizations can offer is, you know, we do have unique skill sets, expertise and restoration. And I mean, we, the collective group that is on this, this uh, uh, call today, uh, nonprofits tend to be a lot more efficient. Um, we're not dealing with big overhead as some of the, in, the consultant agencies would be dealing with. So uh, it is cost effective. And generally we can commit to longer uh, management and monitoring. In our case, when we do a wetland uh, restoration, we commit to 30 years of uh, maintaining that project, but we build that cost in so, uh, up front so that the, the, the client pays that and uh, uh, we hold on to that money over a uh, long-term basis and uh, so that we can cover our costs as we, as we go forward. So some of the things that we've learned over the past 10 years is that habitat restoration does have a marketable value. There are clients out there that are seeking it and uh, you uh, working with various uh, conservation groups and ourselves, we have that, that uh, marketable value to uh, sell to these clients. One of the things we also understood is that you need to hire staff that have some entrepreneurial or business skills. Uh, my background is bi as biology. Many of our people on staff have biological backgrounds. We make terrible business people. Uh, we we want to give things away. Uh, we want to do the right thing, which is which is great. Uh, but you actually do need to recruit the skill sets uh, who understand business and understand that you're providing a value and that uh, there is there is uh, dollars available to cover that. And the other. Uh, point, and I believe Chris mentioned this earlier, is that organizations need to be comfortable with assuming, assuming various levels of risk. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, many of our contracts, maybe just a few thousand dollars, but uh, we on occasion will sign contracts that are multi-year, uh, multi-million dollars. And so you got to have the legal and the accounting expertise within your organization to uh, make sure that uh, uh, you can comply, again, with all the regulations with Canada Revenue Agency and the insurance and, and that type of thing. So there's got to be a uh, willingness to take on some level of risk and your organization may, uh, may have different comfort levels at that. So future considerations, uh, you know, traditional fundraising, it'll continue to be there. Uh, it, in my experience, and I've been at this for a while, it, it it continues to be more challenging. There's just more uh, nonprofits out there looking for uh, uh, dollars for you know very commendable uh, uh, events and, act and activities, and it, it it does become more challenging to get access access to that. I think regulatory requirements for habitat offsets will only continue to grow, and you know I think we've seen some dramatic changes in. Uh, uh, the environment field just in the last few years where there is a real focus. Uh, part of that is on climate change, but uh, overall there's a focus to, to do more with the environment. So I think you're going to see more of this uh, embedded in regulations and companies are gonna have to cover this. And the other thing that we're starting to see is that habitat projects that sequester and store carbon are going to be in demand. And we're hearing from uh, uh, various industry sectors right now that uh, uh, they're very interested in, in looking for uh, types of projects that they can fund. And again, they want to do that close to home. They do have the opportunity to do it internationally, but they want to do it here. So those are some of the lessons that, uh, that we've learned. Uh, again, I think there's great opportunities and look forward to uh, answering any questions that may come along a little later. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks, Tom. That was a great talk and lots of great points uh, for food for thought. Um, up next, we will be uh, hearing a presentation from Kent Rundle. Kent is the, the coordinator for landowner outreach and restoration at Conservation Halton. And he oversees a team of staff who engage watershed landowners to educate them on environmental stewardship as well as advise them on how to implement habitat and water quality restoration projects. Thanks, Kent.
Thanks, Samantha. I was still on mute there. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Conservation Halton is located here at the western edge of Lake Ontario. Um, Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis, uh, from the Wendat and the Anishinaabe to the Attawandra and the Haudenosaunee and the Métis. Um, you know, today, I would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their treaty lands with us. As an agency, our jurisdiction spans a thousand square kilometers, um, which includes the municipalities of Burlington, Milton, and Oakville. Uh, but the vast majority of the land in this area is, is privately owned and managed. Uh, Conservation Hold is a public agency. Um, we do receive base funding from the taxpayers in the area, but as conservation authorities go, we receive the smallest percent of our tax funding compared to, against our operating budget when you compare us across other CAs in the region. Um, and from a restoration perspective, you know, we often say we operate more like a pseudo NGO than, uh, than we do like government. Um, we have no municipal levy supporting restoration project costs uh, and those levy dollars are covering roughly two and a half um, full-time equivalent staff positions. And restoration has been on an uptick at Conservation Holton since about 2011. Um, at that time, we had one restoration technician, um, but at this time we've moved up to, to a total of 11 staff uh, working on uh, restoration projects of which eight and a half are paid through uh, the funds that we're able to generate from our, from our fundraising efforts. So, you know, like, like has been shared by um, some of the other speakers, you know, we, we, it's, it's a bit of like a, a dog's breakfast, I'll say. It's organized, but we kind of are going after money in a lot of different avenues. So um, we are looking at grants of um, both uh, government and private foundations, uh, so corporate sponsorships, um, that philanthropy, uh, compensation or offsetting projects as, as Tom's just spoken about as well has been an avenue for us to explore. Um, but we also rely on a lot of in-kind contributions, um, donations of materials and equipment. Um, we, you know, as, as Chris alluded to, partnerships have just played such an important role in the work that we do as well. And we engage a lot of volunteers to be able to fulfill our projects. Um, and another one of our strategies has been phasing our projects so that we can break them up into little bite-sized pieces that make them a bit more manageable. Um, you know, from my perspective, the best example I can provide is our Corkliffe Park restoration project, where we've sort of applied all of these strategies. Um, we've brought funding in from all, all of those kind of avenues I've described. We've used um, a lot of volunteer uh, inputs, uh, and we phased the project over many phases and many years, and we're still actively doing um, work in the park. Um, and, and rather than tell you about it, I'll let pre-pandemic short-haired Kent uh, do the do the work in the short video here. In 2002, Conservation Halton produced the Brownie Creek Watershed Study. The Brownie Creek Watershed Study identified Corkliffe Park as a high priority for stream restoration as a result of overwidened creeks and, and barriers within the, the creek uh, that were impacting negatively water quality and fish habitat. So what we did to fix the creek in Corkliffe Park were a few things. We replaced the undersized culverts with spanning bridges. We reconnected Mansburg Creek to its original channel, which was still on the landscape. We created uh, floodplain wetland features where there was before online ponds, so it would be habitat uh, for wetland animals and plants. And we did riparian plantings to restore the vegetation creekside. So uh, for this, over the years for this project, we've had over 1300 volunteer hours contributed, um, over 28 partners, government agencies involved. And we've been able to bring in um, over half a million dollars in cash contributions and um, as well as uh, over a quarter of a million dollars in in-kind contributions and, and the work is ongoing. Um, but you know, as, as Samantha led, um, what I'm really gonna be here to chat with you about today is uh, a bit more of our private land restoration efforts uh, and, um, uh, Samantha's asked me to share a bit about a tool we're currently developing called our Restoration Opportunities Database. So I'm going to shift gears here. Um, 
so we kind of have two models for um, financing or resourcing restoration on private lands uh, at Conservation Halton. Um, the first is our water quality and habitat improvement program. Uh, and the second is what I'm going to call prioritized restoration programs. Um, so the water quality and habitat improvement program, um, I'm going to say that this has kind of become our opportunistic restoration arm uh, of, of our work. Um, so uh, rather than us going out and, and seeking out these project opportunities, these are the ones that kind of come to us um, from landowners. Uh, they may have an idea of a habitat or a water quality project they could do on their property. Um, and we try to help facilitate it. So, uh, so uh, you know, kind of, kind of like um, Stephen or Chris um, had mentioned, you know, we administer a, um, a micro grant here. Um, we, they, they will, the landowners can apply to us. Uh, they submit their application. It is reviewed by a project technical advisory committee. Um, that committee is a lot of external representatives, not um, agency reps, um, who. Um, so there should be um, at least less bias, I'll say, uh, and they will review the projects and uh, and then uh, we will assign the money in micro grants of up to $5,000 to the landowners work um, after we establish agreements. Uh, and then uh, we reimburse them at the end of the work uh, to, to finance that micro grants program. We are looking to corporate sponsorships um, and we use, uh, we also rely on our um, program reserves. The other one I've mentioned is our uh, prioritized programs. So uh, our experience has been that um, going to a funder to fund one project on one private landowner's property is often not pal palatable. Uh, but funding a program like Rookies and Brawny Forever, where we're doing lots of restoration work on lots of properties with volunteer engagement, and we're going to uh, kind of pool together all these um, impacts into some greater, um, you know, there's like the sum of its parts sort of um, saying that I would botch, so I'm not going to try to. Um, but uh, we've found that to be successful. Um, and, it, and it also gives us this flexibility or the ability to adapt and pivot if a landowner changes their mind or we have to um, locate new project uh, sites along the way. Um, and, and then, you know, again, across all the speakers, there's been a bit of a theme that it's hard to se secure funds for less fundable projects or for operating costs or just ongoing relationship management. And again, I, we found that by this bundling exercise of taking many small projects and putting them together, we're, we're pretty successful at being able to um, to patch it together um, along the way. So I'm, I'm going to quickly skip over this. Um, this is really about uh, property protection and not about financing restoration. Um, um, but it's something that we feel is important to recognize these voluntary contributions that landowners are making in our watershed. I'm going to now jump on to the restoration opportunities database. So a few years ago, we recognized the need to create a central repository to, um, to capture restoration opportunities in the watershed. Um, there are a few drivers that led us to this. Uh, we were finding that opportunities were continuously being identified, but not always being recorded, or they were being recorded inconsistently. Um, we also recognized that we may be able to better align funding to, to projects if um, to the projects of the greatest need, if we had a bit of a better tool um, to, to back us up. Um, and, and again, as other speakers have alluded to, um, funders' priorities are um, always shifting um, or, or there's a change of government and, and everything kind of goes on hiatus for a year and then it comes back totally different. Um, and we felt that if we had this database with a long list of projects and they were prioritized, we would be able to adapt really quickly and just run a different query to say, well, this is the highest priority project that meets today's flavor. Um, um, and I guess uh, the last point here, uh, or you know, similar to, um, to what Ducks Unlimited is doing, um, we've been experiencing more requests to deliver offsetting projects. And so we're not seeking those out, but when they come to us, we wanted to be prepared to, to deliver um, a meaningful project. So we have built this database. It's built uh, uh, in-house. It's a SQL server database. And um, in the field, our staff are able to use a collector app so they can record the information uh, on site, take photographs. 
um, fill it all out. And then our outputs um, are, you know, are visually pleasing. There are lots of blue dots all over our map. We have over a thousand aquatic restoration opportunities at this point that range from riparian buffers to channel realignments. Um, and you know, so there's a thousand, uh, just over a thousand at this point, and surely there are thousands more opportunities that we just haven't stumbled upon, uh, across yet. Um, kind of what I'll say is phase two of the, the restoration opportunities project um, is to, to build the queries, to get, generate the reports and to prioritize um, the, the opportunities we've identified. So we've, we've kind of behind the scenes built a scoring schema that will look at 10 categories and score projects um, on a range. Um, and then separately, our ecologist team are working to identify um, the highest priority areas to focus our restoration by overlaying existing data sets. We're, we're not trying to go out and collect a whole bunch of new data. We have, um, well, we may not have a, a all the data that would be ideal to have to create this. We have a lot of data and we're gonna to try to use what we have um, to manage our, our, our resources. Um, and so, you know, that photo on the screen is not um, an output that we have at this point. It's an example only, but we're imagining some sort of a heat map where we have these, like, if we could do work here, this would be amazing. And then we'll overlay those blue dots, but maybe the highest priority blue dots will also be red and it'll be a red on a red, um, something along those lines. Um, and so, you know, ultimately what I, I really hope will happen, and this is something, you know, I can't, I, I hope in 2022, uh, is that an infrastructure project, maybe some sort of linear infrastructure project is going ahead and the developer reaches out to us and says, hey, like, um, we have these criteria we need to meet um, to offset, um, you know, do you guys have anything that would be a good fit? And we input that criteria into our reporting tool and it would spit out maybe three to 10 options that are like exactly what they're looking for. And then, um, you know, maybe, maybe um, like Thomas suggested, maybe we become the, the delivery agent, the contractor to deliver that work. Um, so, so that's where we hope it goes. Uh, I think I've burned the clock on my time. I have some closing thoughts here, but I'll, I'll bring this up um, in discussion if it comes up. So um, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Kent. That was, um, thanks for sharing that restoration opportunities database tool. It's a, a nice tangible and, and visible uh, tool and product to show uh, funders, like Tom mentioned, to, to market habitat restoration. So our, our last present uh, presentation will be from Zoanne Morton. And Zoanne is joining us from the Pacific Streamkeepers Federation, where she's the executive director. She wears many different hats, which she'll probably tell us in her presentation. Um, and she also has a, a wealth of uh, experience uh, as a community volunteer, um, also working with granting agencies um, as, and as a board member for uh, government agencies and past chair of the Fraser Salmon and Watersheds Program. And so, Anne, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but please feel free to take your full 10 minutes. Yeah, thanks. One of those things where I wish now that I had put the slides together just so it wasn't my face on the, on the screen. But uh, I figured being the last speaker, it's one of those things to kind of do little bits of wrap up some things as well. Um, so I, um, I work for the Pacific Stream Keepers Federation and uh, with all societies, the first word is a nondescript distinctive first word. So that's specific. And our area of uh, influence kind of is specific region, including the Yukon. But uh, as of this morning, I just got a request from Ireland to um, help them with stream keepers in that area. So it's one of those things of, you know, we talked a lot about different things here and prioritization comes to mind a lot. And I think it's important for groups to kind of understand who they are and what their priorities are. You can spend a lot of time chasing money where you can spend time getting the works done that you want to do. Your group should maybe take a moment to decide, are you wanting to be Ducks Unlimited? It's a big job. Or do they want to be an on the ground work uh, crew who works with other organizations in order to be able to get little fixes done on the ground? So I think it's important to realize who you are. When we heard that there was 186 people registered for this workshop, it really shows that the restoration is something of value to Canadians, that people are coming forward with this. 
It also um, talks a little bit to, you know, Kent's uh, comments there about uh, lots of new organizations coming into form and, and there's a lot of new interest. We find that anytime new money comes into play, new people come into play. And it's kind of important to know what your group wants to do and what you want to take on and be solid in who you are. You've had a lot of funders over the last, you know, however many years your organizations have been running. And now's the time to maybe just take a moment to thank them, to say to them, thank you for being with us along this journey. And here's how we can walk together for the rest of the road. When all this money is coming to play and there's all these big announcements with huge dollar value, $647 million, and that's your taxpayer dollar coming out to work towards the benefit of sediment, is a lot of money. And sometimes then like a local bank or a local uh, community organization might say, oh my goodness, they have $647 million, what's my 500 bucks going to be good for? Those $500 and more so the care of the person who raised that $500 is why there's $647 million coming out from the federal taxpayer. It's those reasonings. It's the work that you folks have done in the past that has brought the rest of Canada kind of into the future. We're now at that political mindedness and entity that they feel that restoration is somewhere um, that we need to be. The rest of the money as well, there's money for protection. I think we have to do protection as well. We talk about restoration and we think, oh, can we go back to the glory days of functioning watersheds? I think if we can restore the function within the stream, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> so if we can restore the function and if we can restore the faith that our watersheds can support life and can support us living on the land as well as the life within the streams, I think we'll have done something really magnificent for, uh, for the lands. So all these groups have been active over the years. And during this time, there's been kind of feast or famine when it comes to, to funding. There's always these big pots of money and big announcements, and then it kind of goes down to little bits of this and that going on and big feast. So those who during the famine prepared for the feast are ready and they are actually in line and their applications are ready, their prioritizations are done and they are ready to go. And rather than maybe, you know, arm wrestling them for that first bit of money that came out, maybe see how your group can work with them to do some of the priority, priorities within your watershed. So you found a problem in your watershed. Is it yours to fix or is there another way to get the job done? If it's yours to fix, I hope you have the skill sets to do so. There was comment a lot of biologists in, in the room and there's a, a lot of biology, but that business background is really important. If you want to be able to secure funds, spend them well, report well, and secure more funds, you need that business end of things and you need to look beyond the sticks and rocks that you're putting into a stream system. Easy money for sticks and rocks. It was interesting to hear some of the new opportunities for that admin end of things. That is a harder thing to do. Um, we do ask though that if you have a specific project that you found is something to do, if you can work towards that and fix it, it doesn't mean that you have to be an entity for the rest of your life. You can bring in a group of people, a group of uh, other like-minded NGOs from the area, work on that project, and then you can go back to your streams and, and work on other projects with other people. We don't need to start a new program or a new society every time that we step forward. I've been a part of a variety of funding opportunities with the Streamkeepers Federation. Like our uh, mission statement is to help Streamkeepers take action through support, education, and building partnerships. And it's that last one of building partnerships that ends up making me sit down a lot and be active on a lot of boards. And one of the things I've been able to be active on is to bring the screen keepers knowledge and their needs to funding tables. And once you're active at a table, I really dislike the word I sit on a board because um, I like to have, think everyone is being active on the board. So if we can change our terms on that one, that would be great. And so with being active on these boards, I find that um, there's been times now that I, I get uh, the privilege uh, of reading all the applications that people write. And there's a few things that come to mind as I read them, but the one that I'm really going to focus on is I can read, and I'm not the only one, that can read an application that got written because the deadline was coming up. Compared to actually a well thought out, reasoned, passionate, and prioritized 
uh, application that fits under the criteria of the organization where you've applied for the funds. It's important that you don't just rush to the end and rush your programs and projects. It really is noticeable to those reading them. And when you're reading a stack of 100 something applications, when you come upon one that was really poorly written and just a give me money, and you're volunteering your time to read all these applications, it, it makes you kind of go like, oh, you know, like, what are you, what are you gonna do? That's to me the more important piece of it. And have you thought it through? Is it in the end going to be a real benefit to the stream system? Or is it more of a benefit to the people that are walking that fine line between being an ENGO and being an environmental consultant? Getting those funds for that day-to-day -day takes a lot of uh, energy to do. And sometimes we'll see a giant application come in because they want the 10%, that 10% to do the admin thing. So it's really great to see that there might be some new opportunities for admin money because I'm hoping that we'll limit that that will allow the people to do the work in the stream because it's the right thing to do for the stream, the right project in the right place. So you found the, the project, you found uh, that you've got something that you wanna do, you've thanked and you continue to work with your past funders, remembering that it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and energy to raise money. You actually have to get have some to get it somewhere. You saw the pictures of the Ducks Unlimited and their their dinner. Oh, those dinners are so much work to put on, and they take a lot of planning and funding and sometimes pivoting on a dime. And all of a sudden, you can't have the venue; you have to go virtual. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff that the funders have done for you to help you in your job. Please recognize, respect, and understand the energy it took for the funder to get the money to be able to give to you. If it's something like a bank who has a, like TD has, has trust funds, Royal Bank is a really big player as far as giving out funds for things. There's all these other um, entities that give money. That means that someone, a person in that branch or at that other organization heard your request heard the, the plight of salmon, heard the plight of salmon habitat, and took that to their uh, organizations and fought for their organization to have funds to give to you. So, you know, keep feeding those relationships. They're really important to, to have. And it takes having all these um, individuals who care about salmon, all these voters that care about salmon to ensure that the political will comes into play now and then we get these bigger uh, pots of money you know that uh, pots of money that comes from government comes it's a sunset it's a treasury board funding it comes with a five-year window and that's uh, that's not anyone's fault um just see it as an opportunity it's five-year money so it starts off and it goes up and then it sunsets in five years People who've been in the game for a long time understand that and know that and understand where the sun comes up and where it comes down. What's been really interesting in the last few go rounds with the federal funding is it's not all come out equal funding, first year the same as the second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. It's actually coming out with a little bit of a reduction in the first year, a little bit more coming in the second year, I won't be the next one, <laughs> but more funding in the next one and then coming down, down again and winding up. The government people are learning how to spend money a little bit more efficiently and effectively as well. So you've found your project, you've decided you are the right group to take on this project and you're going to be the ones who are going to do the job. And so you're going to go out and look for funding. And there are the opportunities like Samantha mentioned about the Aquatic Habitat Canada and how they have a site that's got different funding opportunities. There's a lot of uh, funding opportunities for different uh, reasoning and, and different things. If you have a, an education project, please look in the education envelope for your funding on that one. If you have a sticks and rocks and excavator, please look for the restoration funding. But go to the right funding pocket, and there's lots of different opportunities. I find that Google can be a, a friend or an enemy. It can be either a great use of time or the biggest time waster that ever came into being. But um, what I'm starting to learn now is to keep track of where I looked and what I found. So I keep just a little Word document open and I say, these are the search words that I used and I put them in there. And then I start adding some of the URLs that I found. If I just have a list of URLs at the end though, I just have a list of work at the end. So what I tend to do is put down the page number 
of something of interest to me. So I put in the, the Google um, thing of uh, Watershed Restoration Funding Canada. So I did put in Canada because I wanted to ensure that, you know, I didn't get stuff from Iran because I'm not going to be like funding for our stuff. And they gave me plenty of um, options of things that I could look at. So one that I decided to click on and follow was in um, environmentalfunders.ca. And I got to that one. I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. And it ended up being quite a long report. And I thought, I can go down the rabbit hole of this report or I can start uh, finding things in a more um, friendly fashion. And I, I use control F a lot. That's just a find function. And I use that a lot within documents and uh, on search um, engines for individual websites. I'll use search words on that one. So I put funders in as the, the wording on there. And of all the stuff on that page, the piece that I put aside and would think maybe I'll go back to later is page 67. And it was the future of freshwater funding in Canada, mobilizing collective resources for healthy watersheds. But the important part on that was a list of survey and interview respondents. So it wasn't a list of people who give money. It was a list of who these people talk to, to find out where money is given. So in it, it inadvertently gave me the list of funders from a different avenue. And now I have this list of people who give out money and took the time to fill in a survey about how to give money to you and I. And so they have an interest in us. So I was able to take that and now I have this list of people to take a more in-depth look at. Whenever I'm looking at Google, I tend to set the clock because Google can take your day. It can just suck you down a path and dancing kittens are really quite fun, but probably not productive in looking for funding. So I set a, a clock and I said, I'm gonna look at things for this length of time. I'm gonna keep a track of where I looked and what sorts of things I should look at again in, in the future. Then if a group gets hold of me and says, I'm looking at this, I have this list of kind of areas that I looked at and places that were relevant rather than just a list of funders. Who funds the type of things that we, we want to look at? The Green Guide used to be a, a great one. And yet when I tried to Google it today, I found out it was all about um, changes to my home and heating, which took me down. So uh, it's best to keep, keep a time frame on that. When we're talking about Google and funding and things, um, and record keeping, all that end of things. Um, I think that where your very first slide, I think it was uh, the, our first speaker showed a slide about kind of what they had done over the course of time. And they had it listed out as to things it was building upon it later with, you know, jobs that were done and, and restora or restoration works done, areas opened. Those kind of works should be really easy to find in a Google search for you as well. So remember, you're Googling to find funders, but when you apply for money, the funders Google you. So if you're applying for money to do education in a watershed, be sure that there's someone on your website that speaks to past works that you've done in education in a watershed, and that it's easy to find. If you're looking to do things with excavators and, and looking to do, you know, bring in root wads and stuff, have that come up as a search, put that as a keyword in your website so that that comes up. When a funder looks you up, they see, oh, they've done this before and they did it well. It worked well and they were able to do this. Funders Google you just as much as you Google funders. Spend some time on your website and on your social media pages to make sure that the stuff that you have up there is relevant and fun to watch. Lots of pictures of close-ups of people, not like a, just a far away thing of an excavator in the creek. I see a lot of excavator in creeks pictures. And to me, actually, it makes me kind of cringe a bit because um, sometimes that could be maybe a, a pipeline going in, or maybe it's uh, logging, or maybe it's road building, or maybe it's restoration works. I don't know. When I see the picture, though, it just kind of makes me cringe. So that idea of, of that more close up, and so people know exactly what's going on when they see that picture. It's not just I'm going to dig in another hole. And on that, please, before you dig a hole, make sure that you're going to keep your water intact when you dig the hole. If you're not a hydrologist, please hire one. You know, water is, is mobile and it's really scary and you can lose it. We had a local um, highways department here that just lost half our creek. They dug a, they dug a hole and the water went down it. So, um, you know, as a volunteer organization or as an ENGO, that's not a good thing. We talked about risk earlier and that can be a risk. But if you're applying for set money, if you could really apply for money that is within your bailiwick and then show that it is, show that. Do a Google search 
on your organization name. Do a Google search on the organization, uh, on the creek of interest there, and just make sure that you come up in that top end of things. And if not, do some keywords. There's talk about the Aquatic Habitat Canada and how they do networking and collaboration. It's those kind of things that will help you as well bring up your social standing, that you'll come up higher in the Google searches if you're networking with others. Every time that another group likes you that's similar to you, it raises your ranking. So please look at raising your ranking. So you're looking at your project, you're looking at things that you're going to do today, and you're going to look at things that you're going to do in the future. There's a question and answer, there's talk about monitoring your works. If you stagger your work so it's not all done just during one fisheries window and get all the works done and then you go home, if you stagger your works, it allows your crews to be back in place to be able to review the works that you've done and see where tweaking needs to occur. Personally, unless, I don't, unless you guys hang out at different creeks than I do, I have not seen a project yet that hasn't needed some tweaking, that hasn't needed someone to go back and make some changes to it. So that's important that you have that built into it, whether it is your riparian planting over the next three years, you don't plant a forest in a day, but over the next few years, you're going to go back and do some planting and make sure that things have survived and then have a set criteria of what you're going to look at while you're there. Use that as an opportunity to get back to the people that fund it to say we went back and this is what we saw. We just wanted to share with you the excitement that we have in seeing these things that work really, really well. Always do the pat on the back first and then say, but we did notice a couple things that we're going to need to tweak a little bit. We look forward to working with you in the future. So every time that you look at a restoration opportunity, use that as a chance to build your network within your community, to build your organization, and to build that solid foundation of, of trust, that people trust us as a conglomerate, as the 186 people that are here, that they will trust us to take on some of these initiatives, that they'll trust us to know our limitations that they'll trust us to work with others who have that expertise to get the job done. But the main focus always should be on the, the salmon and the salmon habitat or fish and fish habitat. Um, the piece that you're really looking to, to correct, keep your eyes focused on that one to get the works done and plan for that long-term monitoring, plan for hiccups. You're going to have hiccups, please plan for them. Do record keeping all along the way, that business end of things, have somebody who is responsible for making sure that your receipts are tracking to the amount that was that was uh, said they were going to be. Be sure that you're um, having set times and, and goals and, and uh, celebration points that we've, we've done this, now's the time to bring the media in. We've done this, bring your funders back in again, celebrate that moment. Remember the small media outlets from your local community are watched by the larger organizations and the larger uh, television programming to see where stories are. They don't have a lot of reporters anymore, and so they watch those smaller things. Nothing is too small to share that story. So please share your story on a daily basis. And there is funds here right now. If you were ready for this feast, good on you, let's get going. If you weren't, please don't run for the money. Run because you've got a good project run to others who can help you. There's lots of support out there. Lots of uh, collaboration can take place. So I'll leave it at that. And then uh, folks can ask the questions during the time, but thank you all for all that you do. Thank you, Zoanne. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank um, our expert panel. Uh, six speakers is uh, our highest record for this webinar series. Um, and we really appreciate you volunteering your time and expertise to contribute to the discussion of today's topic. Um, so moving on, we would like to open up the stage to uh, the audience uh, for an open panel discussion. So one of the core objectives of, of today's event um, is in addition to hearing these wonderful presentation is, is to interact with our, our panelists and um, one of the prompts that uh, we provided to the speakers before today's talk 
um, in addition to some other uh, uh, questions to inspire the discussion was how the community of practice involved in aquatic habitat restoration and the work can advise the funding bodies, you know, with Zoanne mentioning this kind of uh, feast and famine, um, how can we manage uh, our projects with the, the kind of ebbs and flows of funding, um, how can we market them. Um, and I saw a really great uh, note in the questions um, from Sherry Hinks from Guelph. Guelph uh, Sherry was actually my limnology lab instructor, so it's great. Um, also, thank you for all the speakers to answering uh, for answering all the questions that were kind of flowing in as we were hearing the presentations. And that kind of made me think about uh, with with Tom's comment about how we need to market aquatic habitat restoration, how we should maybe have some additional skills to be taught to our undergraduate students, the students that are going to be uh, doing the work in the future and whether they can learn in addition to science communication skills but uh, business acumen as well. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up uh, if anybody would like to raise their hand and we can grant you uh, video and uh, audio access. Uh, and if you would like to share your uh, opinion or uh, perspectives or any questions that you might have for the speakers, this would be the time to do so. And as I mentioned, we had a very active question and, and answer uh, window. A lot of the speakers have already jumped in to type in their answers for these questions. Um, but if we don't have any hands, let me see. Sam, I, I haven't addressed uh, one of the questions that came in to me. Could I go ahead and do that? Sure. Yeah, I, I can read it out for you if you'd like. Sure. Kent. So uh, the question for Kent was, how do you deal with issues of ownership surrounding sites that need to be restored? Um, if company X uh, places a culvert that is now perched and not functioning, do you identify that or just the site location itself? Also, any thoughts regarding if that company caused the problem, they should be the one to fix it. How does that play into the restoration opportunities database? Interested to hear any thoughts you have. So I didn't answer it in writing because it was loaded um, and I thought this would just be maybe easier. Um, so thank you, Jamie, for the question. Um, so the issue of ownership um, of sites that need to be restored, um, we, uh, and, and Kate Hayes asked a very similar question, I think, on that. Uh, we enter, we track restoration opportunities regardless of ownership, um, and uh, we may not have a, an owner linked to the property. We may not have a relationship with them, and um, that will get teased out in our uh, prioritization scoring. So if we have no land in a relationship, it's going to score low on uh, on that category, uh, on a couple of categories probably, because we won't have set foot on the property. So we won't have been able to gather enough information for it to score well enough. Um, so, so there is that. Um, in terms of company X, uh, so Conservation Halton is a regulatory agency. Um, so if company X did put in a culvert, um, you know, without having uh, received permissions under the Conservation Authorities Act um, and uh, had gone ahead and done it, then it would actually be a violation. Um, and so restoration of that feature would be dealt with through our regulatory and compliance team, um, not our restoration team. And uh, so that's how we would deal with it. Um, if they did have uh, permissions, um, but it was installed incorrectly, well, then they would still be required to go back and repair that that work. Um, so we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't direct any of our resources to support them on that that effort. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that kind of captures it all. Uh, I hope it does. <laughs> Thanks, Kent. Um, I had a question that maybe directed more to Zoanne and, and Stephen with their expertise um, administering grants. Um, so I know, Stephen, you, you mentioned that um, oftentimes um, groups are renewing uh, their funding. So I wanted to know 
how, uh, well, without giving away too much, how the advisory committee uh, would consider these kind of applications, uh, how drastic is, is the shift from one proposal to the next? Um, I don't know how I should answer that. Um, quite often the groups, if they've been uh, uh, being really attentive to where we prioritize the, the uh, projects that we fund, that they'll be submitting in accordance with a watershed plan that they had uh, done uh, through funding that they might have received from us. And it, typically a watershed plan would identify issues and some, a lot of times the issues are more or less contiguous. So if, if, um, if, if we're funding a project on one part of the stream and then they put in a, for a project on another part of the stream, well, you know, that's, that's easily handled. Uh, in fact, it's encouraged. Um, if it's, if it's, even if it's a project, a diff, totally different project that happens to appear as a priority issue in the watershed plan, then the chances are that that would, uh, that project, that proposal would get a higher score than some of the competition. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. And then we get diverse, quite diverse proposals from the same group, because most of them are dealing with, uh, say, multiple uh, watersheds or sub watersheds or multiple issues, you know, uh, not unusual. Thank you. So, Anne, did you want to add to that as well? Just ask the question one more time. Um, the idea that was brought up um, in Stephen's presentation that uh, they often get uh, repeat uh, applications from groups, whether they were accepted the first round or, or not, or, or just a renewal of the funding. So I, I was interested in how those applications would be processed um, uh, with the criteria change um, for that uh, individual group. Yeah, so I've been at the, the table and read the same proposal a number of times, and usually they're really thick. And it's like, come on, people, change something on here. So just so you know that the people at the tables do read the proposal, so they do know what's going on. It's not just rubber stamp. But you might want to check with the staff at the organization and see why your stuff didn't go through the first time. We heard one of the funders comment about that feedback loop. That was really important. Knowing why it didn't fund and don't, don't just put the same thing in again because it won't be seen any better the next time than it did the first time unless the funding organization has changed their their works. So Stephen commented about the prioritization end of things and seeing things the same uh, group apply for different things within the watershed and that's that's perfectly great and having a map with some dots on it saying that you're applying for this funding to do this but this will be most effective because you're doing the works down here and showing that combination of why one project needs to feed the next project shows that you've really taken interest in your watershed and you know what's going on and you've picked a project and a, and a priority that is necessary to get done. But please don't just keep sticking the same one in every time hoping that it sticks. Uh, check with people and see why your funding application was not successful and see what you can change if you're going to go for the same funding you might want to change envelopes to someone else who funds what you want to get done. Thank you. Um, Kent, I see your hand is up. I know you might have had a question for Tom. So please go ahead. Yeah, I do have a question for Tom. Um, in, in, uh, in negotiating your, uh, your, your offsetting, I'm going to call it an offsetting project, in negotiating your offsetting projects um, with your project pro proponents, have you guys ever tried, you mentioned your use of the contingency line, but I wondered if you'd ever tried to negotiate in um, an additional fee uh, related to um, overall community benefit. Um, Cause I, I, what I wrestle with on these offsetting projects is that it's, it's, it's kind of taxing our resources as a, our team resources, because I'm going to put, you know, one of my best project managers on that project and she won't be available to help with um, the other really important community benefit projects. So how do I balance that, the, those resource needs? And, and should we be asking those project proponents to say, hey, we'll do this for you, but we need an extra 15% to help pay for this, all of our other important work so that we don't lose capacity. I'll leave it there. Great, uh, great question, Kent. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I'm thinking when we started 
uh, to do some of these projects. Um, when we look back and crunch the numbers, we were actually doing it at a loss. Uh, because again, we, we talk about the, you need to have those staff that have the business sense to come in and, and to, do, to do the pricing and do the contracting. So when we look back, we said, well, it's actually other internal funding that we're using to cover some of the costs on this. So, so part of it was it was a really um, learning curve internally for us as to how to price these projects out properly so that you are covering all your, your staff costs, uh, you're covering your overhead costs, administration costs. And then when we started to get really good with it, then you are building, and I called it contingency, but what you're doing is building in a profit. And, and there are Canada revenue agencies have guidelines that uh, you know, a nonprofit has to work within. But as long as you are, my understanding from my level is that as long as you are uh, staying within your mission, so that is we're restoring wetlands or restoring habitat on the aquatic ecosystems that we're working in, whether it's a, a managed wetland that's within a stream system, then you are staying within your mission. And uh, then you do have some latitude to build in uh, profit and contingency. And then you use that uh, to, as you said, uh, fund other parts of your program. Um, you know, communications has always been a, one that has been very difficult for us to fund. Uh, so we use uh, some of the revenues uh, that come into these projects to help finance our communication staff so that they can do the social media and, and, uh, and all that good stuff, uh, our education staff, and, and well as their science. Uh, you know, we, we uh, uh, not, we not only do our, our science staff get involved with the monitoring and evaluation of these projects, but uh, we're also building in some additional dollars that can help facilitate their, their program. And, but I think the key to that is you do need individuals that understand uh, pricing and contracting, and then, then they can help you pull all of that together. I don't understand that component. I, I give that to somebody uh, who, uh, who we get hired that, that does understand that and can do the tough negotiation. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just had a question to pose maybe to George Russell. Um, so your presentation was very insightful on uh, the community council that you represent. And you really presented us with a, a unique funding challenge um, to clean up these areas of concern that are in remote areas but are of ecological and cultural significance. So um, something that you mentioned was um, the ongoing process of securing partners and, and funders for these projects. So I kinda, it kind of brings in the elements of uh, a restoration opportunities database, but um, I was wondering if you could provide um, some more uh, input and, and um, information about how you would uh, go about securing these partners? What are you looking for? Um, and how would you prioritize these uh, projects? Thanks, Samantha. Uh, I think first, uh, what we were envisioning would be uh, to do um, maybe take a year or, or maybe two uh, to, to, uh, to survey and to um, assess these areas, uh, you know, and, and categorize them into areas that are maybe potentially uh, uh, causing harm right now or, or could be could be issues in say a year or two and uh, evaluating you know the level of impact that that they could have so I, I think the first um, year or two of, uh, of any project here would be to do a full assessment up and down the coast of all these locations and to see what's present uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of take this back and then maybe we got, um, we can start putting together what an actual cleanup and restoration project uh, of these areas could look like. And, and then with that sort of inf information, uh, you know, we could put together, I think a really good uh, project to, you know, to talk to people and then act actively get out there and look for partners. Uh, so I see it sort of as a, maybe a two phase type of approach here where we, we would certainly do some assessment in, in the year one, two, and then move into 
to a bigger brother project where you know we're actually going to to have people um, do the the cleanups and the restoration of these sites. So. Great, thank you. Um, Stephen, I, I saw your note that you might have to step out. So thank you very much for your presentation um, and for joining us today. Um, for the other speakers, we're still okay to just stick around for another 10 minutes. Um, we are still open to, to getting some more questions in the Q&A um, as well as the chat. And thank you everyone for joining us if you do also need uh, to step away. Samantha, if, if any questions do come in after I depart, and please uh, send them along to me. We would be I glad will do. to help people. Yep. Uh, thanks, everyone. Really thank appreciate you, Stephen. So as we wrap up uh, today's webinar, um, if we don't have any more questions, I guess I can open up uh, to the rest of our panels. Uh, panel lists, and if they have any kind of uh, burning comments, uh, remaining comments um, about their advice, uh, say, for a funding body, um, where we really need to take um, aquatic habitat restoration within the next five to 10 years, um, and how to benefit uh, all these uh, really important and amazing groups that are uh, on the ground doing this work. I don't, oh, Tom, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, one uh, departing comment. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges for, uh, for groups, and, and we work with lots of other uh, NGOs uh, beside our internal staff, is, is getting access to longer term multi-year funding. And so, if we can, if we can get our funding bodies, and and and, and typically the big funding bodies are government um, at various different levels, to to uh, you know amend or, or design programs that will provide that multi-year funding to groups is 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 critical. The other part of it is, and and maybe if there's some, uh, some university uh, um, professors still online, is the the fact that you know, as, as, and, and again, we talked about uh, bringing in uh, the business side of this. One of the things I think that we undervalue is, is in the nonprofit sector is the contribution we make the economy. Um, because if you give a dollar to the nonprofit sector, they're out there leveraging other dollars and matching it. And, and they're generating much more um, activity than that one one dollar uh, that is that exists so you know I think I think we collectively need to make the case to government and funding bodies that uh, investing in nonprofits is all not only does great environmental things but it it also is real economic generators because we can take that dollar easily turn it into three and probably ten dollars because it's it's amazing uh, what I've seen, uh, what uh, what uh, what groups can do across the country with that. So that's my my two thoughts: longer term funding and making the business case for funding uh, nonprofits. Thanks, Tom. Um, I might just push this to Chris because we haven't heard from him uh, since his presentation. Uh, if you don't mind me picking on you. Not at all. Sorry, you repeat the question? Yeah, Chris. So just some uh, wrapping up thoughts. Uh, any large recommendations for the community of practice doing this work and how uh, we can work with uh, advising or advising grant granting bodies and, and work with this issue of uh, that Zoanne mentioned of feast and famine, um, basically what we need to do within the next five, 10, 20 years. Um, I mean, I, I, I really do see that, you know, we're, we're starting to see a shift in a lot of funders uh, that they're starting to recognize this. And I think I forgot if it was Oanne or somebody said that we're starting to see uh, funders being a lot smarter about how they give out their money. Um, and so I think the number one thing that we can do is, is we need to have these plans in place. That's really where we've been putting the emphasis. This, the idea of piecemeal projects um, and doing things, you know, um, 
sort of, I don't want to say willy nilly, but, you know, sort of here and there. Um, we need to have matrix like Kendrick, Ken has, Ken has talked about, we need to have sort of cohesive plans. And, and so we've been really kind of building towards that uh, on, uh, I think on the East Coast. And, and I think that has done a world of difference so that, you know, we can really go back to the funders and, and we can really demonstrate, hey, we've got a very comprehensive um, sequence of things that we need to do. And, and, and whenever we have done that um, and had that in place, the money flows. So to say that you've got, okay, I've got my list of 100 things that need to happen, and this is part of the big plan, then it allows you to be very, very responsive uh, and allows you to seek out the funding. So uh, we generally find when we have that, getting the money and getting the partners, that that will generally fall in place. Uh, and as I say, I think people are getting smarter about that. So I think the more that we can demonstrate that going forward, that, hey, we've got these big um, we, we know what we have to do and here's how we can do it. Um, then people will, the funders will respond to that. And, and then I think that helps in long-term address some of these concerns. So. Thanks, Chris. Um, Zoanne, I saw your hand up. It did. The, the longer term funding has been something that's been coming up for a, for a number of years. And I think that the funders are starting to recognize that but I think as uh, nonprofit organizations, we could maybe use this COVID thing to our advantage in that there was a lot of projects couldn't get done last year uh, because nobody was allowed to you know, travel together in a vehicle or prices went up because of that. And I think it's time that we, we kind of use that and, and, uh, and some of the other concerns that we have, we have fire and, and floods and you know, freshets happening at different times and using these, um, are they natural or unnatural phenomenon to help work with funders to understand that the work window is quite small. And so having all your funding pour into that small work window um, makes it very difficult to get a job done well over the course of time. We want to do these jobs well. And so to help them understand that they will get a better product if they allow the money, if they're able to, because some funders have set timelines that they have to spend money by, but if they can allow that to stretch a little bit to let us get the work done and to be able to get our A-based excavator drivers, those guys are in demand. The guys that are really, I say guys, but sorry, the people that are in demand are the ones who are really, really good at it. But as more and more people need to spend their money in less and less time, you have to go down to the B and C and D and E and F level of excavator driver and just pick it on them. But it's important that to spend our money well, that we have a little bit freer uh, opportunities to, to do it over a longer period of time and for tweaking. Thank you, Zoanne. Um, I see a question here for Kent. So maybe we'll we'll go to you next, Kent, uh, if you can answer this question and also mine, if you feel comfortable. Um, Chris Borowski from Trout Unlimited crew, currently working with CH on some projects do you share your opportunities database with other organizations or do they send you criteria and you suggest based on your prioritization? Uh, so at this point, uh, it, it's an in-house tool. Um, so we haven't uh, shared it externally. Um, the report, the reporting side of the database, um, you know, I, I tried, maybe it wasn't clear enough, but we haven't built it uh, yet. So it's, it's been an input tool for us for now. We're, we're capturing opportunities. We haven't, we're, we're building right now that prioritization tool. Um, so, you know, in a, in a year from now, I think we'll be, we'll be using that um, as a tool, but it's not going to be our only tool. We're not going to put the blinders on to any other good common sense um, along the way. Um, it, it'll just be, one of the things we do. Um, and then I guess, I, I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, and then, you know, Samantha, I guess to answer your question, like what others have said is it, I can really relate to it. Um, you know, I, I, again, like, I, I feel like we are that pseudo pseudo public agency. So this still rings true for us. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll piggyback on maybe something that um, Zoanne said in her talk, which was about uh, building a foundation of trust. Um, and, you know, I think that is just so important um, for us as, as uh, you know, project leads, especially like with our funding uh, partners, um, you know, feel, definitely take the opportunity to call them, not like email them, but call them, have a conversation with them, let them be a partner, not a funder and let them help with the problem solving. Um, let them feel very involved, tell them when you're having issues so that 
you know, they feel like they're a part of the process. Um, it, it makes it really easy to have um, informal discussions about things like funding timing windows. Um, so, you know, like the number of times we've had a funding announcement in October for a project that should have been done by September 15th to be compliant is really frustrating. And then that kind of builds into it. I think Tom or Chris said about, you know, the multi-year projects. I mean, that, that's how we've gotten around it. We just go for multi-year asks and year one, we try not to put construction in. It's always in year two um, so that we've set ourselves up to be able to succeed. Um, so I, I don't know if that's meaningful, but yeah, I, I think have, have conversations, invite them to your project sites. My experience is they just will always be too busy to actually get there, but it's, it's, it's nice to extend the offer uh, and um, just build a solid foundation of trust. Cause if you can, you know, you know, like Zoanne mentioned that there may be projects that couldn't happen. And this year there may be money available. Um, and if you have a solid foundation of trust, you might be the first person they call um, to see if you can deliver an extra $50,000 of work. Um, I know it's happened to us um, several times. So. Yeah. Thanks Kent. Um, and lastly, if George, you have any, uh, final comments before we wrap up. Uh, I don't have a lot. No, uh, I just think uh, you know we, we've. Uh, for, for, and I'll speak from you know our perspective, uh, and, and you know listening to some of the other uh, panelists and things. You know we have a little bit of, of a different situation. Uh, you know, um, and, and a little more unique when I when I think about the coast of Labrador and you know how it. Is a very uh, remote area, and but still, you know, these. Uh, did I lose somebody? That's just me, but okay. we're just wrapping up. But please, okay. Please uh, and you know, and no, but it's uh, and um, I, I think it's still you know these are very important habitats. I can't stress enough, you know, for for wild Atlantic salmon and char and things that our communities depend on. And uh, I just you know trying to find a way uh, forward and. and Opportunities like this to to share our story and our situation certainly uh, helps. So I, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much, George. Uh, and again, thank you to all the panelists for uh, joining us today and volunteering their time to present presentations and um, lively uh, discussion and answering all the questions from our attendees. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we really hope that you can join us for future events. And uh, on the screen here are some um, links to our social media channels. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, as well as our website, which hosts the funding resource that we covered at the beginning. Uh, and with that, uh, I will just put a poll on the screen. It'll just take you under uh, a minute just to give us some feedback about our event. Um, but that's all I had for today. Uh, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day and uh, a great summer. <laughs>